Hey friends, welcome to the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest, coming to you today with an episode with my friend Corey Allen. Corey Allen is a uh, podcast host. He's got a popular podcast called The Astral Hustle. But he's also a musician. He's an author. He's a man of uh, many hats. Also a meditation teacher. He's got a lot of these goodies over on his website if you want to check them out. And I was actually on his podcast, The Astral Hustle, which is a great podcast if you haven't heard of it and you're looking around for more Covidian, quarantine-esque content. Um, But I really just wanted to continue the conversation with him and keep rapping, so I was lucky enough to have him over here on, on our show, and I think you're going to enjoy it. If you get a chance, thanks for subscribing to the podcast. It's a way of uh, keeping in the know about all. This is episode 108, which is a auspicious number. Uh, so I thought it'd be good for Corey to be on for that one. We recorded this a while ago, but um, 108 feels good for him. But subscribing to the podcast, you'll be sure to catch all of them. And you can also give it a five star review, uh, a couple words about what you like on it. If you want to give it a written review on Apple Podcasts, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks for supporting. Uh, Thanks for everyone who's been buying merch and sending messages of support and uh, those of you who've even been sending donations, which you can always do at uh, PayPal, info at eastforest.org or Venmo, Trevor-Oswalt. That is my birth name. My friends call me Krishna and, uh, you know, I go by this East Forest thing as the musical moniker. Funny thing about East Forest, I, I always was intending it to be the name of the music project and not necessarily the name of me. I didn't want it to be about me. It was more about you know, ideas and doorways and so forth. But over time, like I'd show up at shows and people would say like, hey, East, and I would first be confused. And I'm like, all oh, right, they're calling me that. And uh, I would be embarrassed. So I would just be like, yeah, that's cool. And then years go by. And I'm kind of used to it. (laughs) So um, it's funny how those things happen. All right. So let's get into this amazing conversation with my friend, Mr. Corey Allen. Well, we met uh, a bit back, I think, through Aubrey, and we've crossed paths a little bit. And one thing I noticed between the two of us, as I think I mentioned on your podcast, is that we have a lot of similarities in our interests and the things that we're out there doing. Um, obviously, music and and meditation, and uh, you've got a book, and you've got uh, what are the parts of your ecosystem? Am I forgetting? You've definitely got a hand in the psychedelic world. You're a mastering engineer. Uh, anything else I'm forgetting? Yeah, no, I, I think that that seems to kind of wrap <laughs> I'm it sure up. Sure, there's more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, author, podcast, music. Yeah. Uh, you know, music creator. Uh, you know, that's that's good enough. That covers enough bases. Yes. And uh, I was just listening to your your music, refreshing my memory, and I was checking out particularly the album, The Source, that you mm-hmm. did in 2015. Man, that's some cool stuff. Thank um, you. I had a quick question. Like, is that is that just you, just playing all those little instruments and all the different sounds? Uh, no. So that is, um, there's, let me, let me think back here. So most of the tracks have double bass, which that's a friend of mine uh, named Brent mm-hmm. Ferris. Uh, and then there's uh, a cello on there as well. That, that's not me. Uh, that's another great cellist, uh, Hannah Cho. Um, and then there's you know, the acoustic drums, like the free jazz style drums on there. Yeah. Or my, my dear, dear sweet friend, Lyman Hardy, who oddly, if, if Ed Hall, the band rings a bell, uh, they were like one of the pioneering psychedelic uh, rock bands of the 90s. Uh, he, was, he, he was the drummer for them back in the day. And what's funny about that anyway, um, oh, and so all the other instruments like the, uh, all the percussion, the Fender Rhodes, you know, the synthesizers, mm-hmm. uh, all the other stuff, that's all what I did uh, on the album. But I, I wrote all of the you know, the music, of course, oh, and the tempera and harmonium and all that stuff. That's all me. So um, what's the process of recording that? Was it improvisational? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, yes. So I, a lot of the, my music 
that has been with other people uh, where I've used musicians or, or worked with musicians, I uh, I like to set up like conceptual rule based things a lot of times. So if you were to think of you know back to some uh, kind of 20th century classical minimalist music or something like that, where it'll just kind of be even written rules as opposed to a uh, written score or something. So, for example, uh, on my album, The Great Order, you know, I was trying to replicate, you know, all my music from start to finish in the catalog has been me working with internal ideas like and concepts that I'm trying to express musically somehow. And if you kind of track them and, and follow them, you can see my own personal development aligns with the development and the change in sound of the music. Um, which is weird because my new album that's going to come out is a really aggressive like Atlanta, like trap hip hop album. So uh, really? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just playing. Oh. <laughs> um, but that would be <laughs> <not>? dope. Yeah, <laughs> I have made a lot of hip hop beats in the past. Um, but uh, anyway, so like Pearl's my, my first album. That's, that's the one that really put me on kind of the global map, you know, musically. And it's a very, it's like Fender Rhodes, a lot of like granulizer and, and stuff like that. And and then a lot of just really spacious, open sounds. And um, I think that metaphorically, you know, I was trying to find that presence in that timeless sense of uh, attention and awareness uh, whenever I made that record, you know, that was 10 years ago. And what's fascinating to me is I, I learned a great lesson that it continues to teach me till this day when creating that record was um that i was like i made all the music and i'm, I'm sure you'll be able to relate to this or you know all of your audience that are musicians or creative people can feel this like i made the record and while i was making it i was like i i want i wish i could make an album that just had like these elements but I feel like I need to make, you know, add this or add this to do this to get people to kind of to make it a bit more digestible or palatable. But I really wish one day I'll make a record that sounds just like this, like how I want, you know, stripped down and really spacious and whatever. So I made the record and now I was uploading it to a manufacturer and the fourth track wouldn't upload and it just like got hung and i was like getting really pissed off and i was like come on man like i'm you know because you're so stoked and you, you're yeah, like right the there the yeah, yeah you're right there all this work and it just wouldn't do it and like i canceled it and, and started over and i tried and tried and tried to wouldn't do it and i was like ah and then i thought you know what actually maybe maybe i there's a reason why i wasn't able to go through like it wouldn't upload maybe you know, this isn't right. Maybe I need to just say, like, why am I even... And maybe it was just the time I had to kind of sit and reflect on it. I was like, maybe, why am I trying to make anything other than exactly what I want? Who cares what my idea of what other people want is? And that was a big breakthrough for me creatively, you know, was being like, so I took the album, I took out all the extra stuff I'd added, I made the tracks longer and how I'd originally, like how I kind of quote unquote dreamed I could make them. And then that album was what really helped me kind of push through and, uh, you know, the uh, electronic kind of experimental ambient uh, music scene, more of it came out. And even 10 years later today, people still hit me up all the time. They like, dude, I just heard this album for the first time. I love it. <laughs> like, it's cool that it's kind of had that, that staying power. And uh, it makes sense because it was a real honest, like, honoring of what was arising in my creative mind as opposed to allowing my perception of what others might want get in the way. That's crazy um, that you changed the entire record at the end of the process spurred because it wouldn't upload. I mean, I that's, I know what that would, I mean, that's a big deal to feel like you're done, not just done and you're sitting with it, but done and like, all right, and now let's get it going and put it out. And then something, it's kind of a big uh, motivation to say, I'm going to now completely change this record. Yeah. Yeah, it was, man. And I've, I think Part of that's my personality. I have a very much like I like to garden with dynamite sometimes. I've become a lot more gentle and thought, you know, as, I, as I've gotten older. But uh, back in those days, I, you know, it was very much like, all right, well, let's burn this thing down to the ground and like and start over. And I was, I was down to, to – I look at it as like a good cleansing methodology from, for myself or I had in the past. I mean, do um, you have an intuition like that that you follow that boldly regularly? You just sort yes. of get it, yeah, and you just go for it. <laughs> yeah, I've <laughs> I uh, I've always kind of been like that. Like I'll I, I will get obsessed with something or get like really into something and like a piece of music even, and I will extract like I'll listen to my like my OCD has gotten a lot better. But I used to get like 
I would get one track or one album, uh, like Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. I've listened to a thousand times, you know, like not no exaggeration. I listened to it like two or three times a day, every day for years, because I was just like had to decode and download what was at the like, what was the soul and like on an atomic level of that record and why was that record and why did you know all this stuff and um but then i'm like okay now i never want to hear that again <laughs> you know what i mean i never need to listen to it again and i'm just kind of like that with stuff in general it's like oh once i compute something i um it's easy for me to just move on you know right well that's do you find that that uh, trait that you have is one that's beneficial or does it yeah. feel like it's something you've had to work with as a bit of an obstacle in your personality? Yeah, no, it's good, man. It's, uh, it's, it helps me stay, f keep from staying attached, you know, in the sense of like identifying a part of who I think I am and how I under my, understand myself with something that's outside of me or something that gives, because many people, of course, define themselves by the things that they're involved with or close to or that they think, you know, other people uh, see as their quote unquote thing, you know, and I like how, you, you know, you've talked about that whenever we were on our, uh, on my podcast, how you were hearing maybe some like beats or some kind of like a, maybe you had an MC on a track, I think, if that's right. Yeah, yeah. And well, you were on that Ram Dass record, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you were like... just all of a sudden there's a rapper. <laughs> yeah. But it's like sometimes, you know, a lot of people, man, would not want to do that because like, I'm not the guy that can have a rapper on, on a track. But, right. you know, it's, it's one of those things where you can just, uh, you know. So anyway, people, you know, allow that stuff to kind of I identify them and shape who they are a lot. And I think that to me... It's useful that it allows me to kind of uh, just stay flexible and not really um, stay attached to to the, that, those type of things. Yeah. So how did it, how did meditation? Oh, hey, Kaya, <laughs> got a dog visiting. Hey, no problem, man. And also, as while we're on the topic of dogs, apologies if my dog starts barking at any time because. Uh, I've got a like a, a modular, you know, sense package showing up here, delivery. And so he might add some enlightenment <laughs> when the UPS guy drops it off. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did, how did meditation come to play a role in your life? Um, what was the motivation of that? Or is that something that came from like your parents, or your childhood or... Uh, How did that creep yeah, in? It came as a response to my parents and my childhood. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yes, you know, my, my parents, neither of them were even readers. Uh, they were, uh, my dad wasn't really religious, you know, he's, he's dead, but, uh, he wasn't religious at all per se. Um, my mom was kind of like a, a safety Christian, you know, um, it's nice to have the dog on the other side of the mic for once. <laughs> yeah. Story um, of my life to the last week. <laughs> um, and so anyway, you know, basically just living and growing up in an ecosystem where there was a lot of emotional and I would say psychological destabilization, uh, and manipulation and things like that. And, um, I always like to, whenever I kind of get into this area and talk about this, I always like to be clear that, you know, a lot of people who have come from challenging backgrounds, uh, you know, based upon their, their family or their experiences like that. It's easy to think like, well, I didn't have any like physical suffering in a sense. So maybe things weren't as bad, or maybe I'm being a bit dramatic when I feel like there was some type of emotional trauma. But the complexity of that thing that many people, I found that many people don't realize is that, you know, a family can provide but still, you know, have this, there, there can be trauma in the inner life, you know, so you can have, you can be fed, you know, you can have a roof over your head, but that doesn't right. mean that everything is, is all good, you know? Um, and so because I, uh, you know, grew up in a situation like that, uh, I always had a lot of anxiety and I was very resentful and uh, angry, you know, at my uh, father in the way that, he kind of chose not to really care that I existed too much. And, uh, you know, he disappeared, you know, really, you know, they, my parents got divorced wow. when I was a little kid. And, um, 
And then, uh, so yeah, there's that. And then just kind of the, yeah, the yes, the uh, emotional and psychological manipulation and being, you know, having unconditional, or I'm sorry, conditional <clears throat> love and things like that, you know, from my mom growing up. Um, and there's a lot more, you know, darkness that we could go into, but there's no real need. A uh, whole right life, now. yeah. Yes, yes. And yeah. so basically what happened was... Um, Whenever I was in my teens, I, you know, I'd already started, you know, taking psychedelics and things like that. And um, I heard someone say randomly that they, uh, I heard someone say Nishi's name one time, you know. And so I just kind of randomly overheard it. I certainly wasn't at home. <laughs> and uh, then I was going through a bookstore and I saw that name, you know, on a book. And mm -hmm. uh, I was like, oh, there's that name. That's cool. And we all feel a bit out of sync and alienated, of course, as teenagers. Um, I felt particularly incompatible with everyone in my life system, you know, except for my brother. Um, we're similar in a lot of ways. And I think that whenever I went over and I picked up that book and I started reading it, I thought, oh, wow, this is, um, this is how I think. And it's not necessarily what I think per se, uh, but it's how I think, the, you know, the the conceptual flow of information was so, it was like a complete con consciousness amplifier and like resonant moment for me where I thought, holy shit. As a shit. teenager? Yes, yes. Yeah, that stuff yeah. can be kind of thick, some of the Nietzsche, you know? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I became, and I got really obsessed with them and I, uh, you know, got really obsessed with Western philosophy. Um, and then I, after that, it's, you know, because a lot of the Western philosophers reference Eastern philosophers, some of them do, um, I moved over after I felt like I digested a lot of, and I, back to that obsessive personality thing, I mean, I would just like, I would read for like eight hours a day easily, at least four hours a day, most days wow. in the morning, just go in my room, close the door, and I would like play guitar for, you know, also a lot of times for eight hours straight until I fell asleep with it. Like I would lay in bed with it on my chest, just trying to It's a to 16 like... hour day right there. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not on the same day, but uh, yeah. Um, but sometimes, um, because it's like, you know, it was a little sanctuary, right? It was like this zone. And also this is a bit of a, a side topic, but um, I was obsessed with like, I always thought about playing guitar in geometry, not in uh, notes or, or chords or anything like that. So I was like a death metal guitar shredder, you know, whenever I was that, that age. And so I was with, I would just stare at the fretboard and think about the way that like each, uh, how the fret wire in each strings, if each of those are like a nodal connection point on the fretboard, the geometry of finger movement through those nodes creates particular sound and, and sensation and, and resonant quality and then mm -hmm. how, how you move those things. It's like this unfolding of a geometrical pattern. And I became like obsessed with understanding that the geometry of like the guitar fretboard, right? And so I would sit there and just like try and decode the shapes and, and understand it on that level um, pretty, pretty exhaustively. I was just thinking about something like that with piano today. I was mm. just over here and doing some little recordings and I, I was just noticing how it's often like the way I'm kind of thinking about it in my head or so almost sometimes even visually is those is like patterns yeah you know so I mean obviously Absolutely. how they sound but there's just there's there is definitely that I like that idea of geometry it does it, yeah. it's a good way of kind of looking at it yeah that's how I've always thought about music from the the creator point of view you know or interfacing with an instrument or even uh, if you're working in a digital, you know, workstation, the geometry of how all of the actual sound files are aligned and how they move in, you know, how they're vertically right. and horizontally aligned, that's like, that's really uh, important and something I focus on. Or I just naturally am attuned to that as a point of focus. Um, so, okay. So, so back a side to, note, though, question. Yes. Do you ever, like... Uh, try to not, you know, the, the the idea of not looking at the screen sort of mm -hmm. like to help you kind of tune your ears. Cause sometimes when we're, we see the geometry of like, especially in a, in a DAW, like how things all fit together, it sort of like changes how you hear it. Oh yeah. You know, how you see it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely do that, man. Where I don't, uh, I don't always just gaze into the, the DAW screen because a lot of times, you know, as you were just saying, like, you aren't the the listener expectation is an important 
part of musical writing to me. And, and so if you're looking at kind of behind the curtain and you see when the audio file will, you know, happen in time, you're, right. uh, you know, the illusion yeah. is broken. So, you know, it's coming. And so you, you can't feel it in an organic way. And um, so I, I will play things and, and uh, you know, turn the screen off or um, – just get a little hand mirror and make hard eye contact to myself. <laughs> no, just joking. Um, but anyway, so all right. So back to the thing. Basically, then I got really obsessed with uh, Eastern philosophy uh, after Western philosophy, and uh, yes, feeling a lot of just complete, you know, uh, emotional suffering, a lot, tons of anxiety because of just kind of being uh, gaslit, you know, constantly, uh, and never knowing what was coming, you know, what was lurking for me. Uh, around the corner as far as the the vibe in the house was going to go and just having this constant resting fear. Um, and so, like, which reality would I interface with next? And so Eastern philosophy became, like, it, whenever I began reading that, it was very much, this is not only how I think, but this is what I think as well, you know? Um, I think that there, having a lot of that conditional love and a lot of that... Um, early early traumas made it to where externally of course i was just kind of had those those injuries you know um but internally mm -hmm. the pain forced a recognition of uh, compassion because i needed to f figure out a way i wasn't getting like authentic love from anywhere so i needed to figure out a way to find that and birth that seed within myself so that I could begin to at least feel comfortable and to love, you know, myself as a person as opposed to feeling like kind of dead inside and, and just discarded, you know? Were you um, depressed as a kid? Or? I I would the say... was kind of numb. Yeah, I was, it was numb. No, I mean, I, I took a very, in, like, intellectualizing approach to life and to everything. And, and I'm sure starting off with Nietzsche probably didn't help that, but... <laughs> um, I, I really just, every, like I always, you know, emotions are for our weakness, therefore weak people for lesser evolved people. I was a super hardcore and militant atheist, of course. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, getting into the Eastern thought really changed all that and allowed me to nurture that small flame of compassion, which I was aware of and just protecting, you know, greatly, uh, from, the threats of the external world. And uh, so meditation came from really just reading books. And this is the 90s, you know, so there was no, uh, as you remember, you know, there's no Google, there's no YouTube, uh, there's no <laughs> there's no online meditation courses. I was just reading all these books. And I think because of my my problems with with authority and, and trusting someone saying what something is, you know, um, uh, I never really took one answer as something as the end of of a question you know so i would be reading i would read about all different styles of meditation or thought and i began to read about you know, you know sufi practices or something like you know alistair crowley like you know some magic sort of occult type of stuff and read then that led me to reading about uh consciousness and neuroscience and i became obsessed with reading about psychology and uh, just kind of the science of mind and all that. But the meditation came from that. And it, it really was this beautiful, I, I, I jokingly call it a, my Viktor Frankl moment. But obviously, it's like one one hundred thousandth of a percent of what he was experiencing. But the moment I tried to meditate for the first time, it was very simple. And, and I just like laid on my bed, closed my eyes and began just observing my breath, you know, going in and out. And every time that I exhaled, I tried to relax the muscles in my body and face a little bit more and inhale again and just relaxing you know my body a little bit more and i just had this flash of like of self awareness where i realized like oh my inner life is mine and no matter what happens outside of my body or what is happening around me the world inside of my body that is my sacred place and mm -hmm. it is like it's i'm free there i'm free in my mind i'm free in my body and Realizing that made me realize that, okay, if I'm free in my body, then I can continue to, you know, try and show myself some compassion and care and try and at least alleviate the symptoms that I'm feeling right now, this complete, you know, extreme anxiety. And like, I, I literally lived the first probably 20 years of my life, like my stomach was in a knot, like just constantly. 
That's not good for the body. Not good at all. No. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, hand would shake whenever I would go put the key in the front door or I'd hear the garage door open and, you know, just my brother and I would both be like, oh, okay, our adrenaline's going like, what are we going to, what are we going to get, you know? Um, and so, yeah, man, I, I, and the beauty I think really came from uh, whenever I, I began practicing meditation more, you know, like that and very quietly and privately because if I were to, you know, share that that was what I was doing, it would be villa. It kind of made, uh, uh, so it would be ne seen as negative, you know, it'd be, uh, I would be threatened over meditating because somehow, you know. <laughs> threatening to them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. um and so I just did it quietly and, and I started realizing the changes, you know, just looking through my point of view out into the world. I started noticing my consciousness shifting. I started noticing that like, wow, five weeks ago, I was like a different person. I feel like so much more comfortable in my body. I feel more confident and, and clear minded. And I realized that like, if that was possible to go from there to here, then what else is possible? And that I really have never stopped that ever since then. You know, I, it's, mm -hmm. I realize that you can literally, through intention and you know, being having integrity of the self and uh, open mind and what have you, that you can really change yourself uh, to flourish in whatever way that you desire. I suppose that's the only way is mm -hmm. to make those choices yourself what you know whatever the influences are on the outside it has to happen from the inside out you know when you're telling that story about how you know a an upbringing that seemingly is comfortable or or kind of normal quote unquote how that can be the kind of trauma that we experience sort of that american malaise and i i vibe with that a lot i mean my parents very loving and very supportive. It's just, I think what I was rebelling against was more the kind of the expectation of what life is supposed to be in suburbia. And just, mm -hmm. it just felt sick in a way. It felt like there's more, there's a more beautiful world possible, but there was no example of it around me. And that felt really troubling. And I remember I dealt with, instead of being numb, I was just very like depressed. And mm -hmm. I remember the one of the, bottom moments for me was when I finally got out of all the school, it was like, I, I went, I was 23 and for the first time kind of out in the world and I'd moved to New York city. It was right before nine 11 and then nine 11 happened and everything was just terrible and got worse and worse. And I found myself in a really difficult depression and I somehow ended up at this psychiatrist who was supposed to be like one of the, you know, the quote best in New York city had all those sort of accolades and he could not figure out why I was depressed. Hmm. You know, he kept searching for the like, well, were you abused or did this happen or that? And like, it was just, he was totally blind to the thought that like, perhaps the soul just wants to sing and it doesn't have a way to do it. And it, it's such a blind spot sometimes in, in psychiatry, psychology, at least certainly it was. And I would imagine in many parts it still is, but, um, kind of understanding the the hidden wounds in our past, obviously they're going to be obvious wounds at times, is a good way to try to forge our way forward. Mm -hmm. And for you, I'm hearing about how all this has you know, led to these interests of yours that kind of obviously led to who you are today. And now you're, right. you're, you're sharing that with other folks. Um, is it okay if I ask you a bit about your book? This now oh, is the course. way. I have yeah, some questions course. about it. <laughs> that on, came man. out. Was it last year or twenty nineteen? Yes, yes, tw uh, September of of twenty nineteen. Yeah. So I haven't read it, but uh, is it? Does it get into these this personal journey, or is it more conceptual uh, about um, your ideas and techniques around meditation? Yeah, it's both. Um, it's, you know, the last probably fifth of the book is on meditation. It's actually, that part of the book's actually called On Meditation um, because, and I call it that because I feel like that there have been, you know, millions of words written about the experience of meditation or what it should be like. And I feel like that's a bit of a detriment to the individual who's coming to it for the first time or even someone who's seasoned in meditation. And that, I think talking about, you know, the area around meditation and then getting someone 
comfortable and equipped to then go begin doing it themselves without any, you know, without a bunch of bizarre culturally influenced expectations or anything is pretty crucial to uh, having one really get an authentic meditation experience at a deeper level. Uh, and, and, and is yours based on sort of your own practice or an amalgamation of particular lineage or how does it, how does yeah, that come to be? It, it, it's all, uh, you know, things, all the things that I studied over the years, I took I, like just what tidbits worked for me, you know, and applied them to myself. And then I just came up with a lot of other practices and approaches, uh, over the years, just kind of that, I don't know, they, they, they're flowers that grew in the mind that I plucked and said, oh, that, that's an interesting idea. Self-experimentation. Yeah. Yes, lots of that, lots of that. Um, so yeah, uh, it's that the meditation section is you know there's some basics, but also it goes into um, some specifics that uh, really work well for me and things that I've I've come up with. Uh, so the rest of the book is essentially uh, about mindfulness and presence and um, how there are a lot of great works. I, you know, this is a funny thing. I I did like. I don't know, like 50 interviews whenever the book, before the book came out. And I heard a lot of people say in questions, like, you know, there's so many books on mindfulness out there. What makes yours different? And I'd be like, what are mm-hmm. your top three? And they're like, uh... <laughs> you know, top three what? My books on mindfulness, you know? So oh, it's just, oh. it's a funny thing that people say, you know As what I mean? if you're the expert on it, I don't know. Yeah. No, no. Well, I mean, <laughs> people say like, what makes your your book unique, you know? And it's like, well, what are the other ones that you like, like amongst all these? And they're like, I have no idea. It's just kind of a <laughs> funny little schism of like, of thinking to me. But um, the point is that the the great, some of the great works, you know, something like, uh, Be Here Now is a great one. You know, Power of Now, which is actually I haven't read, but uh, I know Power people, of Now? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, man. That one was a big one for me in like 2008, 2007. Uh, I need to get into it. It's like the Beatles. Like I, I'd never listened to the Beatles until this <laughs> year, uh, until last year. Come on. I'm well, serious. I mean, you heard it, obviously. Oh, sure, 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 sure. I heard you it. never it's like, like dug in. Yeah, yeah, I never did. Uh, and really, I came to it through the like uh, the back door. Like I came to George Harrison's solo work. And was like, oh, wow, his early solo work is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I started listening to some of Paul McCartney's early solo work. And I was like, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I went and listened to the Beatles. and was like, oh, yeah, they're good. (laughs) It turns out. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah. I hope it, it's be funny if you're kind of like the Larry David of music fans. You're like, oh, the Beatles. They're just, it's not my thing. That's how I always was. Yeah. I was always <laughs> like kind of resented. I was like, they're fine. I know people like them, but they're just not, I'm just not interested. And then uh, it happened to me with Frank Zappa as well. Like I was, I couldn't square. I think from, I was so obsessed with like, uh, highbrow music, you know, I think it goes along with the right. super militant atheist, you know, uh, teenager mentality. Yes. So whenever I was that age, it was like death metal, gangster rap, black metal, or like 20th century classical music, you know, like <laughs> soup, like Stockhausen and Ligeti and Zanakis mm-hmm. and, and whatever it is, like the most complex maximalist compositions mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. And so Zappa, you know, he was really into Verez, you know, and, um, but I would try and listen to his music and I'd be like, you're not allowed to make such <laughs> such technically complex and proficient and savanty music and also have a sense of humor about it. That was like, uh, it always annoyed me. Like I couldn't square that in my mind as a, as a kid. And uh, just recently I was like, you know, I should go back and like revisit Zappa because I, uh, from some conversation I had with someone and I was like, oh yeah, he's a genius. <laughs> um yeah man. yeah i discovered a lot of things late in life too as well yeah um what role in this whole i mean you spoke about it a little bit uh but with psychedelics mm-hmm. as a as a way of pushing you along on this journey yeah they were they were huge man huge and uh, lsd you said or different sure things or, okay. <laughs> yeah well for me uh, it was like mushroom experiences if there were a handful of them over the years that were seminal yeah. uh, i don't have much experience with lsd you know personally mm, so yeah. i'm always curious you know what compound it is or if there is one 
Yeah, that was what was available whenever I was in high school. You know, that which was, was where? Where were you growing up? In Austin, still in Austin. Austin, yeah. okay. Yeah, and I think there was kind of like a. I'm not sure if it was nationwide, but certainly in Austin, there was a bit of a a psychedelic renaissance in the '90s. But it really aligned with kind of house music and raves and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of raves happening uh, all the time in Austin. And what's if this is a trip? Like I've I've thought about this uh, as an adult. You know, as a 38 year old. Um, whenever I was like 15, 16, my friends and I would get in the car and like drive to a club downtown where they were having raves and it'd just be like dudes standing on the sidewalk outside of the club and you could just walk up and be like, Hey, you have any acid? No. Yeah, sure. Here you go. All right, cool. Thanks. Here's five bucks. (laughs) And then just like, that was it. And just the idea of like, to me, you know, thinking of a 16 year old or something going, to some random stranger standing on the sidewalk and buying, you know, on the street downtown at night. Yeah. It's completely so ill-advised and dangerous and stupid, but. Yeah, know. yeah. I, well, I look at, I mean, look at me. I'm not exactly, I don't look like a drug dealer, but for some reason, I don't know if it's my weird hair or something, but I always have people coming up to me asking for drugs. Mm-hmm. No, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I remember one time I, when I was living in Brooklyn, I was in Dumbo, so it's under the Manhattan Bridge. Uh-huh. Kind of be like your prototypical scene of like buying drugs like you're under a bridge and the subway is going over <laughs> yeah. some guy just pulls up in a car with like jersey place and he says hey man um we need drugs and i was just like what 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 who does this you yeah know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah seriously <laughs> you answer with a literal like Okay, well, I hope that you find them. <laughs> you know, like yeah. Most people are in uh, need Well, there's of a bar there and a CVS <laughs> yeah. up there, and, you know, here's a, here's a television. Yeah. yeah um, but it sounds like for you, they, they did play a bit of a role, or is it more kind of minor? Oh, no, no. It was quite a big role. Uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, in that time, um, then, you know, I was taking them, and I, I always took them pretty much— um, as an investigation of mind, even from the beginning, and not really ever recreationally. Like I never, you know, would be like, oh, let's take some, you know, psychedelics and go sit at the lake or whatever like that and hang out. Like it was always, for me, it was always by inner exploration, even from the jump. And mm-hmm. it was just, you know, I, I, as I'm sure that all signs are pointing to this, like I, because of where my mind was, I became obsessed with cracking the, what I kind of call uh, cracking the egg, you know. Uh, I wanted to figure out my mind and see how I could get on the other side of these things that were limiting me, these things that I was constantly suffering from, and then discover and explore what was possible in the world of ideas and also what was possible with myself. Like how how much can I, of the ocean, can I hold in my mouth? You know what I mean? And, and that from... <laughs> From an that early can be, age. Uh, that can turn out in a lot of uh, challenging ways if you have oh, that yes. attitude with psychedelics. Like, how far can it go? It's like, okay. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. No, and it, and it did. Cosmic and I, slap down. Yeah, and it must, right? It must. I think mm-hmm. that some of those, and you know, even the, the symptoms mm-hmm. of those experiences can lead to similar disillusions, which ultimately I think are necessary on, maybe not necessarily, but I think they're sort of built into the path in some ways. Like, Mm. If you were to, you know, someone was to begin taking a bunch of psychedelics, they might move f- into the next chapter of their life, then kind of believing um, in metaphysical things more strongly than they had before, which in some cases being open to some metaphysical n- parts of reality can, are beneficial, but it can also be, it's it's extraordinarily dangerous field, uh, which is extremely fertile for spiritual bypassing and self-delusion. And my main interest has always been in truth and in like something usable and something like how can this benefit and, you know, increase the, my and, and our self-awareness and uh, effectiveness as a person, you know, as a force of compassion and, and equanimity yeah. as opposed to like, you know, using it as an almost self-manipulation to create an answer uh, instead of acknowledge Well, this reality. is an important point you're bringing up. Um, I think it's a Jungian idea, spiritual bypass. Mm. Either way, the notion that you're kind of missing the main show by getting wrapped up in maybe the surface exploration uh, of your spiritual 
obsession or w- what have you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what is the litmus test, you think, to know? Because sometimes it's a bit of a delusion that maybe has a lot of consciousness actually involved, right? Mm-hmm. But sometimes the idea is that you, you don't see that blind spot in yourself. So maybe you think you're quote unquote very much on your path, but you're really kind of lost in an alley where it's like, man, you're missing, you're missing like the real wound here that, you're, you know, you're covering mm-hmm. it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I think not do you, have, to gen- do you have a way of knowing? Well, I think just time, man. I think that like, you know, not to generalize, but I think that many, many, many people do just what you were just describing. And that's why it kind of at the beginning, I was saying how it's almost built into the, the, the journey in some way. Um, mm-hmm. It's a necessary, uh, r- almost rite of kind of self passage where you do end up in the alley, like in this delusion kind of area with blind spots and only by continuing to explore and like test and try and find congruency with objectivity or your own inner you know feelings and 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 sense do you see the contradiction and the misalignment with the story you're telling yourself about reality and hopefully you know un- unfortunately a lot of people paw and just they end their journey there and they stay somewhat in the in the alleyway and um and it is what it is and it becomes what it becomes but you know hopefully one can be at that spot realize um what's happening and then turn the you know the wheel back over to something more centric and and use the that's why i like this notion of uh that i i uh, tend to use describe this sometimes as casting the net into deep waters you know um, it's important to cast in that in the deep waters, but it's it's m- just as important and, and crucial to then draw that net in and sort through the trash and jewels that you might have discovered and integrate those. So you now know now like I know from being a you know a swerver, I would say you know <laughs> this reality mm. swerver of being like you know this Nietzschean like everything is it's all scientific materialism you know and uh, complete reductionist you know of, of philosophy and of the natural world and the universe and then taking a lot of uh, lsd and you know i would do things like well to finish that point and then going way out into the other side of being like oh i can think i can <laughs> change reality with my mind you know and it, like let me prove that to myself over and over again you know robin and tom wilson was a a, uh, a mentor of mine, and I ended up working for him for a little while. The author, no kidding, mm-hmm. in my what early twenties. <laughs> yes, oh yes, he's the best. I have one of my favorite pictures. I have a picture of of uh, him and me whenever I was twenty two, and he's like seventy three or something like that. Which is wow, pretty what rare. an honor! Yeah, absolute, absolute honor. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, he uh, he talked about these things a lot. You know, and I, I really appreciate- reality tunnels. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Reality tunnels, man. And um, yeah, anyway, so I would uh, do, you know, a lot of exploration, you know, with myself and um, I would take, you know, LSD or whatever and or whatever it might be and, and do these things where I would like create my own float tank, you know, in my house. I would like uh, turn the, <laughs> go get in the, uh, the bathtub and like turn the water on and like put the stopper in there halfway and then have the water like dripping, j- like just running just enough so that there was always warm water, like flowing through the bath and then like close the door. And um, we might've talked about this on, on my yeah, podcast. Actually. And I told you, I'm glad you didn't drown. Yes. It's yes. like the classic <laughs> LSD story of drowning in a totally, bathtub. Yeah. Totally, man. Um, but it was a real, uh, I think doing those things led me to, you know, and just continue to explore with my mind and, and uh, partake in the research of psychedelics allowed me to, ultimately, I think it it made my way of thinking a a lot uh, more flexible and modular instead of having this fixed script that I was stuck to. Do you think that like any kind of story that we tell ourselves, in a sense like you're like, you you can look back in our lives and say, I held the story of being a rational materialist or I held the story of being a nihilist, and then I held the story of being sort of a naturalist and then a humanist or whatever, and here I am in this story. Like, they're all a form of bypass. Mm -hmm. Because any story is just that. It's a story. It's a a mask on top of the reality, which is sort of uh, this, from a Zen perspective, maybe a a nothingness, 
Yeah. A, a, you know, a, just a plenum of being. And we're always grasping for a story, an explanation in a way. And the one that we have currently is usually our most current version, the, the OS that, mm-hmm. we're, that we're working on. Yeah, that's, uh, this is the topic of my next book, actually. Ah. Uh, because I think it's increasingly important uh, in our uh, you know, high velocity, high speed, high complexity, uh, you know, technological age of, it's really, a, we're in almost in a war of reality right now, battle for reality, for uh, a, a claim to objective, obje- objective reality, I suppose. Um, sort of a phenomenological punching match happening right now in society and in our species. And I think that, um, the way to help people wake up from that, of course, is to first identify uh, the fact that it's happening at all. So the fact that we do use narrative thinking to, you know, it's just how we're designed as, you know, biological critters, you know, being animals. Like we think of our lives, we must think about them in stories because the the way that we think and the way that we interact with, you know, space and time and ourselves and our uh, self-understanding and so forth is taking the constant bits of information that our minds are scanning. You know, we've always have done this for like hundreds of thousands of years. We're scanning for bits of data and then kind of capitulating this image, this impression is what I call it, an impression of what is. And then we almost must believe that that is what is in order to then have the the ancient brain, the archaic mind, have the will to move forward and to have its meaning mapped so they can believe that it shall continue on as an organism, right? And the story is the almost the carrot that we we hang in front of ourselves to walk towards. And that's why people get really upset whenever you disagree with their story. And something like social media where it's it's creating, you know, like the Twitterverse has created this just wasteland of uh, toxicity because everyone is arguing on behalf of their stories and uh when someone is you know their story is challenged it feels like like people's stories about themselves are so rooted deeply into their their the meaning and symbolism they apply on their own egos that whenever the story or the concept is challenged they feel like and, it, and even worse if it's disproven then they feel like they are being erased their it's ego identity. their, right. their capital Your self is being identity. challenged hmm. so they literally they have a visceral response because they feel like they're being attacked like physically because mm-hmm. like if they, if i'm being erased i'm under attack so i have to fight back and that's like mm-hmm. why you know something like twitter has become the cesspool it is but of course i know you know this but uh, the real reality is that all of those narratives are illusions none of them are true not even the one i'm talking about right now not even me explaining this narrative thing is is real. It's just this this uh, bisected entry point to as close as I can get with where I'm at right now and how I'm equipped to think and talk about what is. But yeah. even with all of my model agnosticism, I still have to remain even agnostic about my model agnosticism. <laughs> well, anytime we look back on our lives, we look at the stories we've held or the opinions and beliefs that we ha- that we're holding on to, and they've inevitably changed and it must give us the pause to think that whatever I'm holding on to now, I will look back on and have a different feeling. Yes. You got to loosen the grip on that because yes. it's, it's just that it's something you're holding and holding as a form of creating an identity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's, which is necessary, right? As, as we were it's a just tool. talking about. Yeah. So it is a bit of a paradox. Like, yeah. Uh, It's that idea you get into these sort of nuanced discussions about uh, how we have everything is perfect, yet we have karma in a way. Right. And people, it's maddening. And people get angry when you say these things. It's like, well, everything, you know, it matters. And I'm like, yeah, it does. And it doesn't. And Mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means nothing. And everything. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. That's what the poetry is. That's what the music is dancing around. Uh, It's... There isn't an answer, and yes, I don't but know, man. what there it's what a, there is, I I think, is that see, I really got into that space, particularly you know, with a lot of uh, you know, Zen uh, took me to that way of thinking, and also a lot of uh, I ran because of Robert Anton Wilson, I got introduced to uh, the work of Alfred Korzybski, and so I early I'm not on familiar. 
Oh, uh, he's basically the father of like non-Aristotelian logic and general semantics. So he wrote, kind of created the original system of general semantics. And um, non-Aristotelian thinking is essentially saying that uh, looking at reality as map. So he's the one that came up with the Alan Watts took, the map is not the territory or the menu is not the meal. That's where Alan Watts mm -hmm. got that from. Mm -hmm. It's from Korzybski. And early on, it set in my mind uh, this notion that things are not A or B, things are A and B at the same time, you know, N, C, N, D, and E and F. And so it made me begin to kind of wake up to the fact that my reality was a perception. And I had a real, like the, one of the biggest aha kind of consciousness amplifying moments I've had in my life. And it's one of the most important. And I, I it's something I, I talk about it uh, frequently because I really, it, it's so valuable. It's like, it leads to so much more peace and understanding and the possibility of compassion and all these things uh, and a, and a re massive release of suffering. And that is simply to realize not only, not only uh, intellectually, but, but live and try and experience the fact that you, what you perceive to be reality is simply a, a perception. You know, it's just this, your nervous system is abstracting the world outside of your skin and all of your senses are taking in this data and binding Filtering. it together yeah. based yeah. upon your past experiences and your cultural reinforcements and your genetics and your own life script and the, the chance of what you've, you know, ideas and, and even the sequence in which you interacted with ideas or things or, or whatever build this filtration system and this whole script and story of how you perceive what is and realizing that you're just taking this reading from an objective world is so powerful because you realize that, oh, we're all like these little flashlights, you know, just like trying to shine a little bit of light onto this territory that's out there that is really inaccessible. Well, at least I believe it's inaccessible. I've talked to some neuroscientists that disagree, but- um, What's inaccessible? Objective reality, which I don't know how one can, can even look at information about objective reality with the human nervous system and claim that it's not subjective. You feel what I'm saying? This starts to feel like a quantum discussion about the observer and the observed and things like this. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I hate to of. bring in, uh, not to be random about that, but uh, you're right. You're looking out through the portal of your being. It's hard to be outside that. And maybe the only way to do that is in states of non-dualism, which does that ever truly exist in a pure form? You know. Yeah, no, I don't think you can do it. I think you can become aware that it's happening and that's all you really need. That's all, you don't mm -hmm. need to, you don't have to see objective reality because honestly, it wouldn't make any sense. You know, if we could observe what is in its totality outside of the filter of the human mind and nervous system, then think about like, just as a, as a What quick, would be the point? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, what would be the point? It would be <laughs> static, you know, on the radio because yeah. you think about like, the, the vantage points through which you can look at the universe are human. You can observe the, the way that a human sees it. You can, uh, you know, a rat sees, I mean, sorry, a uh, uh, snake sees in heat signatures. So they see thermal view, like the predator. They see a, a thermal view of the world. A bat hears, they have echolocation. You know, they hear the, the acoustics of the world. And it's like, we're all taking these different, these readings of the same thing. So imagine trying to, experience that times a thousand all at once, you know, it's just not, it's not, doesn't seem yeah. possible or necessary, right? Uh -huh. And so I, I could talk about my experience. So also, uh, it, whenever I was about 18, I was really, uh, uh, at the same time of being obsessed with Robin Anton Wilson and Korzybski, I uh, naturally became obsessed with uh, Buckminster Fuller. And I was going through a critical path as kind of a great first take on uh, how humanity might evolve to a you know higher minded type of uh, t you know futuristic society, and he has a, a notion that he talks about Buckminster Fuller that he describes it very much from an engineer point of view, which it is uh, the same thing we're talking about, which has been talked about by many mystics and, and Buddhists and whatever, and is uh, he describes as non simultaneous interactive apprehended processing. So that's how he say that again. Yeah, non simultaneous interactive apprehended processing. So sure. that's 
his yeah you feel that or are you, or are you playing oh i feel it in my heart no I, that's just a, a word salad but uh, uh, okay you say non or yeah, none so non, well he says none for some reason none. But, that's so, that lost me at the beginning i was like what is none so it, basically it's non simultaneous so not, it means that as we're perceiving reality we have our singular vantage point and view of reality based upon where we're at in space time and that all other events around the world and in the universe are continuing to happen outside of our realm of awareness or observability so it's all happening simultaneously but but none so life is in a spontaneous flow of natural chaos but it's happening none simultaneously because we are perceiving it from a fixed location from a fixed you know sense system at one time and then, so, you know, for example, for anyone that's not into these type of ideas, like as we're having this conversation, you know, someone just tripped in a crosswalk in Shanghai, someone's going up an elevator in New York right now, someone's having sex in Paris, someone's having a glass of wine uh, in, you know, Argentina or whatever, you know, it's all happening right now. Someone's being born, someone's dying. Uh, and so uh, there's that. And then the apprehended interacting processing bit is apprehending just means that we are taking in that information, right? So we're apprehending it with our nervous system and assimilating into our consciousness. Um, interacting with it is that reality and our lives are a cyclical feedback loop. So we're in a consistent and constant inescapable flow of taking in what is in reality through our filtration system and then feeding back and resonating with the information we've received. But it's like a circle that's like, if you drew a circle with little arrows, pointing into your mind and then back out into the world and then back into your mind out into the world. That's what this flow of perception and expression is, is like. Mm, sounds like um, a toroidal uh, thing. Right. And processing is a bit of just, uh, it's analysis. It's, it's being, mm. you know, self-reflective and trying to understand this process and, and yourself in, in the midst of the process. Right. So that phrase for whatever reason, you ever get like earworms? I'm sure you do with music, you know, where you, you hear this melody or a lyric and you just get, it's in your head, you hear it over and over and over. Yes. So I had that as an earworm, the non simultaneous interactive rapid processing. And I was walking That'll around. That'll eat your brain, man. That's oh, one of those. Oh, it, yeah. it, it that's literally, a, that's it a did. Tapeworm. Yeah, I was All eating right. the back of my eyeballs. Um, and so I was walking around you know, like a mental patient, just like muttering that to myself. Oh, I worked in a bookstore at the time. And I was just walking around muttering that like f under my breath, just thinking about it for a long, long time. And one day I picked it back up. I was muttering it, walking around. I go into the bathroom and I, I actually, I had this in my, I might put this in the second book, but I had this initially for my, in my first, and now it's the way, but I took it out. But it was the section called The Unbearable Lightness of Peeing. And uh, I went into the bathroom and Whenever I went to the urinal, whenever I started peeing, I had this, I was saying that phrase and I had this, that knowledge turned into lived embodied experience. And it was like the movie set of my life. All the walls fell down and I saw all the cameras and it just, I had this uh, awakened moment and I don't mean enlightenment. I just mean like my consciousness got raised Um to where I realized that I was making a perception. Like I was living the fact with the awareness that I was perceiving reality and that never went away. It's only deepened. You know, it's one of the most beautiful like blessings that I've had in my life is to to have that sense of awareness. And this and happened have, while you were peeing? Yes, and I have, a, I have a deep, I don't know how long this podcast is, but I have a deep reason that only came like a decade later as to why it happened when I was peeing, um, which I'm happy to go into if, if we have time, but. Well, I also would like to, uh, before the podcast is over, if you're willing to actually, maybe you could lead us in a meditation, a short meditation. Oh, sure. Too. That's my other, that's the only other agenda piece I had because it makes sense more than talking about it to to end this by diving into that space. Yeah, certainly. So, um, so basically, I, all that to say uh, that that I, I had that experience and it was very viable. Um, and then following through, you know, this this kind of string of, ideas that we've been touching on as far as realizing that, you know, there is everything is and isn't. We are experiencing this impression of life. There is an answer. There's no answer. It's all this balanced, you know, uh, light and dark uh, it, on and off type of system that we're 
we're, we're kind of trapped in. And um, as you said, that being in the midst of that and kind of the center point of that is very freeing. And a lot of people, you know, that don't have any interaction with these ideas have a hard time seeing someone being able to be happy in that space. Uh, but I will say that one of the, the dangers of that space, and this is, um, I think, an important, it was important for me anyway, was that I got into that space coming from the hardcore materialist, you know, scientific reductionist, atheist mm -hmm. type of space. And even through all of this series of, you know, uh, I would, you know, once again, as a teenager, I would take psychedelics and meditate for four hours at a time and, and just really, I would light a candle every night and stare in it and meditate until the candle, I'd stare into the flame and meditate until the candle burned down, you know, um, all these all these different type of things. And I, but I was still very, very uh, materialistic about it all until I was kind of like proven till that I didn't even, that even materialism is a script. You know what I mean? Um, so, I was just playing video games, man. So yeah. it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, also very valuable. Uh, and so I was too, but it was the video game of Corey Allen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <all right. laughs> and uh, all right. So uh, mm -hmm. I kept, kept pulling the cartridge out and blowing on it and putting it back in and seeing <laughs> if the game worked any better. Um, so... So after all that, I got into this place that I end up in the in the book. Actually, I call it existential paralysis, where I got so tuned out to and tuned in, I suppose, to that infinity and being just at a, in a wash of the chaos and infinity of the universe and you know a human existential situation within it that became so overwhelming that, and this is when I was in my early twenties and mid twenties. Is I would like wake up in the morning and just be like, huh, you know, <laughs> from the overwhelming nature of of being able to perceive that non simultaneous nature of of being. And Robin Anton Wilson, in fact, is the one that said, "Make sure you open your heart chakra before you open your mind chakra." And I was like, "Whatever, old man, I got this figured out. It's all mine, no heart." And I realized why that's so important is you need the compassion. And patience to be able to perceive uh, a glimpse or even take a glimpse of the totality, right? You need that love to deal with what you, you know, all the darkness and light that you can see at once. And so I got stuck in this zone where I would like walk outside every morning. It's like, oh God, like I would, it was inescapable for me to not be able to think about like, I'm making my coffee. I'm like, okay, this, I like water is like this weird molecular structure. And like the earth is made of all of this water. My body is made of tons it's of too water. Too much information, my exactly. friend. Exactly. Yeah, I'm heating up this sickness. water. In, information sickness. I'm heating up this water right now. And where did this kettle come from? And these beans, who invented coffee? How did the fact that, you know, these people from, yeah. from Indonesia, et cetera, We're et cetera, not meant to know. Yeah. Yeah. And then going outside and being like, all these people are in their cars and they're like, everyone's having their own narrative experience in their house right now. And then they're all going to get in their cars and drive to these different places. And it's like the, you know, the veins of, uh, the roadways of the veins of our, you know, species body. And they like expands, he contracts and every human's like a blood cell right. moving and, you know, just like all that shit. Explosion. Too. Yeah. So much where it was like, it, it was um, interrupting my life, you know? Um, and I realized that like, I got into this deep zone of like thinking about meaning there. Cause I'm like, well, what matter? Like what means anything? If, if this is all just this blasting static of isms and isness, then like what, why is there a meaning or symbolism ascribed to anything? Why try? Why do anything? You know, why, why it's not? Kind of nihilistic. Yes, yes, yes. Like why, what is the point of any of this? It's all like just basically, I was trying to attach it to a Zen idea of like, well, and I suppose maybe even like a more Taoist idea of like, well, let me just take my hand off the sailboat and just allow it to all do its thing and become a passenger uh, in this experience. But that, uh, of course, you know, ends in a lot, to, it turns into a lot of suffering and I was still suffering. And one of the great uh, realizations I had was that when you reach that point in your inward quest, in your inner journey of those crossroads, that is a real crossroad. It's the crossroad of light and dark in the sense that even though it is all on and off at the same time, and as you were describing, it is all being and none being simultaneously, uh, and there is no real reality, 
what we do have and what is important to recognize in that moment is that what we have there is choice. And so meaning, there is no meaning in life, or there is no meaning to life other than to live, right? That's a simple one that people overcomplicate. But meaning in life is the meaning that you create through your actions. And so being in that zone, you could easily choose to be like, oh, well, I'm going to be a sociopathic business person and go try and, you know, like be the, the, uh, the dude that was the pharmaceutical guy that made, you know, made a bunch of millions of dollars by increasing everyone's, like arbitrarily increasing the price of prescription drugs 300% or 3,000% or whatever. It's like, you could go be that guy very easily. Or uh, you could choose to lean into the ideas that you know encourage human thriving and potential and love and you know for me anyway it was like oh this is the this is like the choice of light and dark it's like i can now that meaning has fallen away it's up to me to rebuild it and i you know took that very seriously and held a lot of integrity towards like okay now my action will be picking what I do in the face of infinity. And that is yes. how you build this beautiful type of meaning in, in life. That is the soul's journey. Mm -mm. Thank you for sharing so much of that, that story and how you arrived to some of where you are. Um, it'd be lovely if you have the time, if we could, if you might take us through a short meditation. Yeah, sure. And uh, we can just close it out on that. Absolutely. Let me uh, do... Uh, one of my favorite daily uh, meditations that I do, and I, I call it the Golden Buddha meditation. Uh, many times in my, uh, how visionary are your meditations, by the way? Mm, what do you mean by visionary? Define. Uh, I don't. Like, I don't feel like I'm literally in a, a scene, but then again, my imagination can go to places. But like nor do this, I feel it's technicolor. Uh huh. Okay. Like in the same More way, feeling based for me. Okay, like whenever you take, if you have taken some type of psychedelic and in your mind's eye. I haven't done that, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Music for mushrooms, it turns out it was all like a, this conceptual. Shitake. Yeah, it's for yeah, cooking. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's for cooking. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Music's for mushroom stroking off. Yes, it's um, for picking. Music for foraging. Yes. Um, so do you have like a kind of a, the, a mind's eye landscape that opens up uh, visually in those spaces. I don't know. Okay, I interesting. Yeah, my, my meditation has become of highly visionary where perhaps if one was to take ayahuasca and they have this light show in their mind, you know, of yeah. like these scenes. Yeah. So that's what my meditation is, has become. It's come well, just to. do your thing. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 So interested in tapping into other worlds. Definitely. Definitely. So I was going to say is that in, in that journey, in that experience of that, what the theme that has arisen over and over and over is gold light, gold bodies, you know, gold things, this type of thing. And the representation of gold and light has become. Uh, a real powerful theme. And I had a interesting uh, thing that dawned on me. was like, oh, that's why all the Buddha statues are gold. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's do this. All right. all right. So um, I would say, so if someone's listening to this still, uh, just close your eyes and... Uh, if you are in a place where you can relax your hands and your legs and your feet and your shoulders and all of that, um, do that and just take a slow, soft uh, breath in and feel your stomach expand. And as your stomach expands, allow the air to move upwards and then your chest flows forward and expands with it. And the breathing is not forced, it's gentle, it's delicate, it's natural, it's not theatrical. It's letting go and allowing yourself to breathe deeply and as fully as you possibly can. You do it every night when you're sleeping and now you're just going to do it while you're awake. And we often have shallow breath because of a clenching and a holding of tension and 
anxiousness and stress and the more we can slowly relax that and allow that to to blow off and burn off and unclench, the deeper our breath can become. And through having a deeper breath, we'll have more space inside of ourselves. And that inner space is what gives rise to an ability to be self-aware to see what's coming and what thoughts are arising in your mind and to choose what thoughts to turn into actions, how you want to show up in this world and what parts of yourself that you want to nurture and feed and share with others. So allow yourself to take another good breath in, allow the stomach to gently expand and Once again, the torso rolls upwards, the chest expands. And when you exhale, you simply let your chest fall. You don't have to try and exhale. Your body is designed to do it on its own. So you just let go. And then another breath in. And this time when you exhale, Let all the muscles in your face and your shoulders and your arms and your feet and your thighs and your stomach, let them all relax as you let your breath out. And then another breath in. And once again, allow your muscles in your face, shoulders, body to relax and soften and deepen a little bit more. Now in your mind's eye, visualize yourself almost as if there's a camera outside of your body looking at you. And what do you look like in the room right now from the outside? Maybe you're sitting there in a chair, maybe you're on a plane, maybe you're at your desk, maybe you're lying in bed, what would a camera show if it was filming you right now? See yourself sitting there, standing there, lying there. Now imagine breathing in golden light. If you were to look in your mind's eye and just see this horizon almost like the edge of a planet. As you breathe in, allow your breath to draw a golden light over the horizon, almost as if it's coming from source itself, flowing towards you. And as you breathe that in, it flows through your chest into your heart and through the side of your chest into your ribs and fills up your entire body with this golden light. If you'd like to visualize yourself from that camera, that external viewpoint again, and try and imagine that golden light filling up your body, you can certainly do so. And now when you exhale this time, imagine this, these shards inside of your body. If your body was hollow on the inside, just imagine these black shards almost like broken glass. And allow that golden light in your body to melt those black shards of glass into this thick paste, this sludge. And it drips down the inner walls of your body and pools in the base of your pelvic area. And now when you breathe in, you draw in more golden light through your chest And see that golden light move underneath that black sludge. And as you exhale, allow your breath to push that upwards and it to blow that black sludge at the top of your head, almost like a dolphin. 
It's releasing all of the negative fragments of emotions and traumas and pain and suffering and discomfort and negative self-talk and all these things that all of us carry. You draw in another, another breath, visualize more golden light coming in. And now this time, as you exhale, it flows upwards once again, cleaning the sides of the inside of your body, getting every last bit of that black gunk out and blowing it all at the top of your head. And now as you can see this black gunk flowing out, then you see golden light flowing out the top of your head. And you know that you've cleaned and purged the, almost the ash that's inside of your body. It's the wood of life burning in the furnace of the self. And it creates ash. It must create ash to have combustion. And that has been cleared. So now again, take another breath in. And visualize more golden light coming and entering through your chest. And really see it, really feel, try and feel it entering through your, your body. And now it's radiating out of your limbs, hitting you in the inside of the fingertips, radiating down your legs, hitting the tips of your toes from the inside. And just feel completely charged with this brilliant, beautiful, almost liquid golden light. And as you breathe out, imagine that golden light just ever so softly bubbling out of the top of your head and it's running down the outside of your body like liquid metal covering you in gold. And now if you were to look at that camera of what you look like from the outside, you see yourself. But now you see yourself completely covered in this beautiful shining golden light. And then you notice that everything you're touching, what you're sitting on, the floor that your feet are touching, all the space around you, your desk, your bed, also now takes on that golden appearance. And you feel a connection and resonance with all things in a oneness. And you realize that you are not just a observer of universe and what is, but you are what is itself. All right, thank you for doing that guided meditation with me. I feel good. Thank you, brother. Yeah, good deal. Um, that feels like a good place to close. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time and diving so deeply into your, your own stories and just the vulnerability of, of, of sharing it all. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. It's my, my pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me on the, on the pod. I, I uh, had a great time. I appreciate it. I'll link to your world in the show notes uh, so people can see all the different things that you do, your great podcast and uh, your book and your music and everything. So... Awesome. Thank Cheers. you, man. Yeah, yeah thanks, thank you. Thanks, Corey, for joining us. I enjoyed that conversation. Definitely had to put my thinking cap on, but it's always good when you have someone who makes you bring your A game. Uh, check out Corey's his book and his podcast is awesome, as I said, but he's also got a new album out. Um, and this song you're hearing in the background is called Divine Waves, and it is some of his music but he's got a lot of things to, to dig into, and I think you'll enjoy all of it. Thanks again for reviewing the podcast and sharing it and your lovely support and for being a part of the community. So you guys keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit, but if you do, you know what to do. Do it with grace.
Thank you.